So Michelle and I built it from the ground up, um, every piece of it. We decided um, what the curriculum would look like, um, how the lessons would be formed, the criteria for getting into the program, all of that. So I'm going to describe it a little bit to you. Um, you may have questions about it, that's fine. You can go ahead and put them in the chat, um, but this will kind of lead us into the discussion today. So mindful art is a therapeutic intervention for students that are exhibiting signs of trauma. It's a structured group setting um, and it provides routine and consistency. So under the program description on this slide, you see that I wrote, it says it's based on trauma-informed research. So a lot of the research that Michelle and I read was um, showing that this structure and routine really makes students feel safe. And so that was something really important to us when we were creating this program. I've been teaching art for a long time, so I know that there is a therapeutic side to teaching art or being making art, but in doing the reading about um, trauma, we found that there were a lot of mentions about how art can really help students reflect on um, themselves internally and reflect on the feelings and thoughts of other people. There's also evidence um, that it reduces cortisol, which is that stress hormone inside of us. Um, so it shows there have been studies that show that after making art, cortisol levels are actually reduced um, in people. So let me tell you a little bit about the program and how it operates. We have four sessions currently of this program. One of these sessions is a K2. And so those students are with us for half of a year. It's weekly. And once the half is over, so usually the end of September until December, we then switch to a new spring group of K2 students, and that's usually about 10 to 12 students. We have two sessions with grades three, four, and five. Those are full year groups. Um, we had originally tried half year groups, and uh, our feedback from the students was that they preferred the whole year, um, which helps them really form relationships and build trust within the groups. And we also have a fourth group, which we call our Mindful Art 2.0. And that is um, a group of students who have already been through the program once with us, but through our data that we look at, we've figured out that they really could benefit from that extra support to go through the program again. So it's a little bit different. Um, lessons are different. Uh, the process is different that the students might participate in just to give them something fresh and new. So when the groups are formed, Michelle and I are really thoughtful about how that happens. We get feedback and recommendations from staff. We also um, use our own experiences and relationships with students. So we will have students on our radar, you know, shoot each other an email. Oh, I'm thinking about this person or this kind of popped up. What do you think about this student? Um, we look at data such as how often they utilize the support room or what other interventions we've tried with the students um, in the past. And we have a list of criteria that we look at. So we came up with a list of um, kind of points that would maybe make the student be someone we feel should be participating in the program. So what have they been through in their lives? What have they experienced? And how are they presenting that? So are they someone who is um, you know, acting out or is very withdrawn and quiet? We also then, when we're forming the groups, look at all of these qualities that the, the students possess. Um, so if we have a third grader who might just need um, a mentor, we find a fifth grader um, and kind of place them in that group. Um, so with our three, four, five group, it's really easy to do that having two sections. We can say, you know, oh, this third grader would be great here with this fourth grader or fifth grader. Um, they could use that friendship or that mentorship. Um, and the same thing, if we have a student who's very quiet, we might put them with someone who's a little more outgoing who can kind of maybe um, encourage them to come out of their shell a little bit throughout the process. So when they're in the group, we have some progress monitoring and data that we, we look at. We have a formative assessment every session. 
So that formative assessment just kind of asks a few simple questions like, are they participating? Um, when we're doing a reflection or a group time where we're talking together, are they talking? Are they quiet? Do they pass a lot? Um, and so we just keep note of that so we can kind of see how they progress through the program and what support they might need. We also develop a personalized goal for them alongside with the student and with um, teachers or staff. So we might kind of know what a student needs to work on and we'll kind of talk with them through that as they're developing their goal. And then we check back in with them throughout the, the program to see how they feel like they're doing reaching that goal and what we can do to support them in that. And again, as they're in the program, we go back to that data. Um, you know, are they utilizing the support room less? Are they um, needing other interventions? Or have we been able to scale those back while they've been in Mindful Art with us? And what we've found has really linked back to the research that we've done. So we've really been able to help students with developing coping skills. When they're going back to their classroom or they're going back to their homes where they some of their problems may actually be very visible, some of their issues may be happening in the classroom or at home, we've gotten them to kind of be able to be more mindful of those times maybe practice some breathing exercises or drawing or art making when they're feeling those ways in those other places. And also forming a sense of metacognition. So students really start to understand themselves a bit better and they're more aware of themselves and some of those triggers that they might experience. Um, so we've had some really good growth where students have been able to express to us like, I see that this is an area where I'm really needing some help or I see that this is a time when I'm getting upset. So I've been practicing some breathing during that time and it's helped me. Or even telling us I really am still struggling during these times when I'm getting into an argument with a sibling or I'm feeling stressed out at school when, I, when I'm frustrated during my learning. And also forming trust building within the group. So we have found um, some really nice friendships formed some, some friendships that we've been surprised have formed. Um, students may start off, you know, with, as with any new group, any of us feel this way, where they're not comfortable sharing or willing to share as much as they might if they were close to the people in the group. But by the time that the group is, um, you know, coming to an end or by the time that the group has kind of been put together that they, um, are starting to feel more comfortable with sharing their artwork and what they've made and even sharing life experiences. Um, the image that's on the slide you're looking at right now is called a comfort box and that's actually the last project that we typically do in the program. The students all get to decorate um, a little box, painting it, adding those little pieces on and then inside of the box are slips of paper and those slips of paper um, are little messages that have been written to that student by everyone else in the group so they can be very personalized you know something the student has learned or noticed about this person like um, you know you have a really great sense of humor um, i love the way that you always support other people in the group or if they feel they haven't gotten to know the person as well they might be more generic examples such as um, i love it when i see you smile or um, you can do it keep working keep trying So when we're in person, um, as I had mentioned before, we try to keep the same structure for every time that we're together. And it typically looks like this. We start off with a mindful moment. Um, the picture that's up on your screen is one of our favorites called Shake It Off. It's on Go Noodle. Um, it's usually one that the students will request uh, as they enter because they really enjoy participating in it. Then we have the activity of the week, which Michelle and I have um, planned out uh, what will happen every week uh, in a certain order to kind of support and scaffold off of other lessons. Um, then we have a share circle, which is reflecting on the activity that they did, um, either showing the work or asking how the work, how the process of making the work felt to them how they might take what they've learned into another area of their life. And then we close with another mindful moment just to kind of refocus them and get them ready to go back to their classroom or wherever they were. 
So Melody, we have a question. Um, what strategies helped maintain the group work and the trust during the shift to virtual learning? Right, so that is something that um, we're, we are working on um, when we shifted over to the virtual learning. Um, it did not, we were towards the end of our group with them. Um, we had been making plans to wrap up because Michelle was um, going to be going on maternity leave and obviously she's a big piece of that um, social work part. Um, so we did some activities on Google Classroom. Um, however, it wasn't as structured. So moving into this upcoming school year, that's definitely something that we're trying to figure out. And as you'll see in a couple of slides, um, I've kind of come up with some ways that I'm hoping that it will work. It's a tough thing because there's a lot, obviously, you have to try to build and create that trust and those relationships um, in a virtual way and, and kind of tackle that social emotional piece. So again, as with what many of us had to do during um, that time, um, it's trying to figure out exactly what that should look like and how to do that with the technology. Kristen, are we good to move on? We are, thank you. Mm -hmm. So today's topics specifically um, revolve around fostering empathy and encouraging authentic conversation. Now, as the question had just asked, this is a shift because we're used to doing this in person. Um, we have some norms that we have put in place um, in person that have worked very well for kind of promoting these concepts and establishing that trust. And so um, as we move into a virtual world with this or a hybrid world, um, how can we still kind of encourage empathy and authentic conversation? So I think what I'm going to do is I'm gonna kind of talk to you a little bit about what we have found in person, but I do think that some of this can start to move into um, an online format. So, you know, that modeling of listening and expressing feelings. Um, Michelle and I really do a lot of just trying to show the students what that looks like, the body language that goes into listening um, and things like that. And not only do Michelle and I do it, but we kind of identify students in the group that have a strength in this area. And so we kind of look to them to help again show other students the way that it might look. Um, and we usually have um, a couple of kids in the group that are really good at doing that. It's a strength of theirs. Um, while we're in our reflection group, typically we will give snaps when students are sharing information. So snaps are just showing that, um, you know, we hear what the students are saying, um, it might be something that we're agreeing with or we understand, maybe an experience that we have also had. So when students um, kind of put themselves out there and take that risk to share, that's one way that we can kind of um, just respond that we've heard them. And also, you know, using phrases like, it sounds like what you're saying is, um, and, and kind of connecting the students in the group in that way. So it sounds like what you're saying is similar to what Kristen said about how she felt when this happened. Um, so again, it goes back to what the things that we're saying and doing really model for the students, um, how they can, can be um, in the group doing the same things to support each other. And then also pointing out those similarities and differences. So like I just said, you know, it sounds like what you're saying is similar to Kristen. Um, so some of us have shared experiences that have happened, you know, often some topics that often come up are um, siblings and how we deal with siblings, um, pets, school. Um, we've had conversations around loss and grief. Um, and so understanding that even though some of the same things might have happened to us or we've had similar experiences, we might be reacting to those things in different ways. What does it look like when I'm reacting to something 
as opposed to when Kristen is reacting to something. And, um, and both of those things are okay. And maybe, you know, maybe we can appreciate the differences of how people react, but also maybe understand like, oh, that's another way that I could react in this situation. So just developing that understanding that everyone's feeling things, um, we may not feel it the same way or process it the same way, but we all, we all definitely are experiencing things. When we're trying to encourage them that conversation that is really authentic, that shows that we're actually hearing what people are saying, um, I think one of the things that's really important is understanding um, perspective. And in the lessons that I'll show you in just a couple minutes, um, we really try to encourage that everybody's got a voice. Again, in the group, you may have someone um, in, in a classroom setting or any group setting, you have different personalities. You have that person who it feels really comfortable speaking out. You have that person who maybe is more reserved and waits and holds back um, to let others kind of go first. And so we want to make sure everybody's heard and everybody starts to understand like, I really love speaking out and I don't mind being the first person to speak out, but maybe I need to hold back a little to give someone, someone else that space to kind of have a minute to speak out as well. Um, and understand that there are different thoughts and voices inside of the group. And also, again, kind of getting back to those similarities and differences, maybe it might change their mindset a little. So if you're spending that time really listening and hearing what another person is saying, it might make you think like, oh, well, this person is thinking this, and I never thought about it this way, but this really makes me now consider another side to that story or another piece there. So I think one of the biggest pieces with that that we've been able to really accomplish in person and are working on now online is um, opportunities to share thoughts and ideas. So I put a little question mark after physical space because Michelle and I are very used to having a circle. We all sit around. Um, even the way that we have them sit together when they're working, we have them you know, we, we are very mindful when we put certain people together. Um, and so people are sitting near each other. And how is that going to change now if we're, if we're in a hybrid situation, if we're in person, but we're in our separate spaces, or if we are doing this online somehow? Um, so that's really important though, that body language and that figuring that out, how can we still encourage that authentic conversation, even if our physical space might have to be different than normal? Um, open-ended questioning. So really giving the kids time to answer those questions. Um, you know, sometimes in the classroom when I'm teaching art, um, you know, there's a struggle to find that time. You want to kind of move on with what you're doing. And I think a lot of us in the sake of time and, and kind of in our minds of what we want to get across in a lesson or where we want to get to in a lesson, um, we forget that giving students that time to kind of take that open-ended question and really think about it and process it is important. So we try to be really mindful again of, of practicing that in class and that, pro or in mindful art, pardon me. And that practice does make progress. So the more time that we leave for authentic conversation or that we have, um, the better that they get at it. And again, we encourage them then, like, how can you bring this back to your classroom? How can you bring this home? How can you make sure when you're in class that you're hearing these other voices and that you are really making sure that you're expressing yourself, you're keeping your mindset open to other people and, and kind of how they might view things. So, Kristen, are we ready to move on? Kristen's muted for me right now, so us. Oh, we can move on. I'm going to go ahead. So these two lessons that I'm going to show you today are two that Michelle and I have included in our curriculum for mindful art. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is mountain and valley. 
Um, and this one we have done in person many times and we've had a lot of success with. And um, so again, have had to kind of rethink like, what could this look like in a virtual format? Um, and then the second one um, that we call what's going on, um, I think might is a newer one for us, but one that we have found a lot of success with, with hearing um, different voices and perspectives. So what I've done here is I've created a Bitmoji Classroom. Um, I don't know how many of you have had experience with Bitmoji Classrooms. I was seeing them a lot in the spring and um, wasn't sure if they were for me. They seemed a bit cutesy um, and I wasn't sure about how I would use them for a classroom or in a classroom experience. Um, but I took a course on how to make them and I realized that it actually might be a good way for me to, to kind of teach with my students. Um, I'm very hands-on obviously being an art teacher and so this seems like a an interactive way to kind of do things with my students and I thought it'd be a little bit more interactive for you today. So the link that Kristen provided you, you can actually, um, it's this presentation and the Bitmoji Classroom is in there. So when you have time, you can kind of play with it and, and do the different things that are in here. I'm going to show you some today. So typically, I'm going to show you first. Oop, sorry about that. Um, typically, what we do is we make a drawing of mountains and valleys. We have a slideshow, which I'll show you in just a moment. Um, and that's how we introduce it to the students. Um, but these are some of the results. So if you click on this, um, you'll see that these are student examples of the work that they have done in the past. We talk about how mountains can be high points or um, times we feel good or successful in our lives. And those valleys can be symbols for low points or times when we're struggling in our lives. So these quotes here, um, the one that's in this upper right hand corner, this was um, a student of ours from last year and um, she really loves her grandma. She gets to spend time with her grandma on weekends and so you can see that reflected kind of in her struggles during the week. Her, For her, her struggles are weekly. It's that valley starting on Monday and by the weekend she's kind of feeling like, yes, she's ready for the weekend for that grandma time and she's feeling really good. Um, the one that's in the lower left, we get this quite a bit. Um, I'm sure some of you hear this in your classrooms or when working with students, you know that when they're struggling, it's a low point for them. They might always not, they might not always be able to even express that that's a struggle for them. It might come out in a different way, but um, you know, it's those are times when they're struggling. And for some of our, our students in our group, that's actually a goal is to work on feeling more confident in a certain subject area or or finding strategies to kind of help them be more successful in a certain subject area. So um, if we go back to that slide then, um, what I tried to do when I set up this classroom is I tried to start with um, a mindful moment. So if you can see here on this little bulletin board, what I would ask the students to do first is to click here for a mindful moment, very much to how we start the structure of our actual sessions in person. So when I click, um, I put this right into a Google slide, mm -hmm. so it's not on YouTube. I put the directions here so that if they needed that support, they would have it during their mindful moment. Um, I also thought it would be nice because they could go back to it at another time if they needed it. Um, so I skipped ahead a little when I showed you this, I'm sorry. This is really where I would want the students to start, obviously, because I wrote it down. Um, but <laughs> um, and then what I asked them to do in this is to click the Life's a Climb poster. And so the reason I'm going to ask them to click that is because it links to a Google form um, that will help them participate in this project in a different way. So 
not knowing what materials students have um, can be a struggle. Um, it's frustrating for them. It's frustrating for us um, as educators. So this is a way that I thought that they could participate um, after watching a slideshow about the mountains and valleys of life, they can write their name and then they can look at images. So they can choose an image that maybe speaks to them instead of creating an image if they don't have that access at home. Um, they can choose an image and then they can kind of talk it out. So tell us about a time when you felt like you were in a valley or a low place. What did it feel like? And then a time where you felt successful, you'd reached the top of the mountain, a high point. Usually we would have that conversation of how can you support someone who's in a, a valley or feeling like they're in a low point? So giving them an opportunity to answer that. And then again, because typically in person, we would be able to have conversation of is it okay with you if I share this? Is it okay in the group? Do you want in the group to respond or would you rather pass? So giving them the opportunity for them to share the information or to keep it private to themselves um, so that later on it could be made maybe into a slideshow. And I know that I can share Kristen's information, but I can't share Michelle's information because she'd rather keep that private. So just trying to keep in mind with different students in the group, how they might be feeling, and then they submit it. The other good thing about a Google form is once they've submitted it, I get all of those responses and can actually review those responses with the group if everyone had said, yeah, go ahead and share it. So um, different ways to use that information. Um, here's another way that I came up with to use this, to do this project. So this is something, um, Oh, good, it came right up. So this is a, a Google slide. This is actually the Google slide show that we would show in person. We can have the students make a copy of it. Hopefully that'll work. My little wheel is turning. There we go. And so I'm going to move Kristen's little picture I have of her in the right hand corner so I can see what I'm doing. So in this slideshow, when I present it, Um, what here, let me just close this a little perfect. Um, so what I did here was I made a video to get started. Now I was saying to Kristen yesterday, I've really had to get over video, like how I look on the video and what I sound like on the video. I pause myself there, uh, because I don't like the way I look and sound on video. Um, but it's a good way to make contact with my student. Um, and I feel like, again, if we're trying to build that trust in those relationships, they need to see that. So the video basically tells them to look through these pictures. Um, again, this is what Michelle and I would be doing in person typically, is going through these images with them. And then it's going to be showing them ways to complete the assignment. So again, two more videos. If they want to do a drawing, like I showed you, we do in person. There's a video for how to take a picture of that and attach it. And if they would prefer to use clip art or they don't have access to art supplies, there's a video on how to do that as well. You can watch those later. I'll spare you the videos. And this then is the actual page that they're going to do the work on. In the video, I tell them that they can exit out of the presentation and then they could do their work right here. So if, for example, they were going to put in clip art, they go to image, it's all in the video that I show them this. They search the web, comes up here. And then when they click that, they get images, they can scroll through and find one that they like. puts it in there. I showed them how to move it so it's centered because the art teacher in me needs that to be centered. I like that composition. Um, and then in here, I show them how to click inside of the text box and they can type in whatever it is that they want. At the end, they can just share that with me.
doesn't usually show my private email as well. It's because I'm on my laptop right now, but if I click my work email, then that just send, then I would get a copy of whatever they made. So again, I can use that and I can put that into another Google slideshow to show them or something like that later on. So I'm just gonna close out a couple of those boxes so I don't have too many things open. Um, another thing that I've incorporated in here is music. Um, so if they click on this radio, it goes to YouTube to some guitar music that they like that we use quite a bit um, in class um, so that they can be listening to music in the background as well while they're working. So again, trying to take some of those pieces of in-person mindful art, incorporate it into a virtual mindful art, keeping in mind that those are the pieces that might be more trauma sensitive. So again, that process of having a mindful moment, um, listening to some quiet, relaxing music while they're working, those things to kind of get them, um, you know, feeling relaxed, hopefully in a, in, a, in a way to kind of start to build that trust within a group in a different format. So I'm going to move on. Kristen, are you good with moving on? Any? Yes. If anybody has any questions, again, put them in your chat. Okay, so this is another Bitmoji classroom and this is for our what's going on lesson. So again, I tried to keep this the same, that structure and routine. So they click here for a mindful moment. Um, again, same directions. This time I did the shake it off mindful moment. As I was saying to you earlier, it's a popular one. So I liked to use that one. What I did here is I tried to figure out some different ways that you could incorporate this into your own classroom setting, um, knowing that people have very different levels of comfort with technology. And I, so when everything happened in March, like I didn't know a lot about how to use anything on Google, um, working K through five with art, um, I don't really, didn't use it. We use paper. We use materials that are physical materials for the most part. So um, it wasn't something that was on my radar, but I learned really fast that I needed to figure out how I could use the technology. So um, I created different ways of this, doing this lesson so that maybe you could be inspired to use one of them or you could use one of them if you feel like it works for you. So here's what we're going to do. Um, usually, Michelle and I would find images from magazines and, um, you know, ads that would kind of um, be funny or maybe look like people who are having conversation or something like that to get the students to start thinking about what's going on in that picture. So let me give you an example. This is a Google Doc. So if we were in person, this image would be on a piece of paper. Um, we would have several images. Um, we would pass them around to the students. So Kristen might be looking at this image. Another student in the group might be looking at a different image. And then we ask them to tell us something about it. They can write a sentence that describes the picture. They can write a caption or they can just tell us their opinion about what's going on. They keep their little post it to themselves. And then as a group, when we're all done looking at all the pictures, we share out what everybody said about this picture. We share out what everybody said about the next picture. So in this Google Doc form, what I was thinking is that students, if they all have the doc, can actually collaborate on this. I didn't change this from yesterday. So what you could actually do is just students could be typing in their name and then they could write what they think is happening or write the caption that they want to write. So I can't believe the ball missed the ball. Um, and so then everybody could kind of see in real time what it is that um, other people are saying or thinking. So that could be a collaborative piece there. Um, another way that I did it was with a Google form again. Same directions. 
um, when they fill out this form then and submit it, it would be going directly back to me. So in this one, I've included four different pictures. Uh, I, the only one that I, the only question I made that they had to answer was the first one. So if they don't have something to say, they don't have to write something on this. But there are the images here. And then once they have written down what they want to say about each one, they can submit it. And again, I can see those responses and I can share those with the group once the students have completed that. Another way to do it um, would be to use Flipgrid. I'm a new user to Flipgrid. Um, I did the training in the spring. I participated to become Google certified. And so when I was doing that, um, when we reflected on a chapter, we would um, have to make a video on Flipgrid. So same directions here, there's the image, the students can record a response, and then everyone's responses show up here. So you could play my response. If Kristen made a video, you could play her response. So again, there's a little bit of a collaborative piece there where people could all be interacting and hearing what others have to say. So um, the other thing that I was thinking about then is, Google Meet would be um, an opportunity for that true face-to-face -face discussion. So we're going to try this in a minute with an activity, but what I was thinking was with what's going on, which I was just showing you, is that during a meet, you could actually show an image and then get responses in real time. So you can share your screen, you can have that picture up there and students can all be writing down a response and then sharing out what they've decided to say. I was showing you that Google form, so students could use the Google form. Um, they could turn it in. Once you have those results and responses, you can share out uh, what the responses were from that form. In the first project I showed you, Mountain and Valley, um, where we talked about making a copy of a document, you could create a Google slideshow that has all of those images that students either um, cut and pasted or that they drew themselves and if they wanted to share that information you could also have that information about their highs and their lows on there and then have a discussion about it. Oop. So what we're going to do, get back to my classroom. There we go, now that link is live. So on the little Keith Herring poster here. Oh, sorry about that, hold on one minute. It went to something that wasn't supposed to. Try that again. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually try this out. I'm going to ask you to look carefully at the picture and then um, on a little piece of paper in front of you or in your head, write a sentence that describes the picture, a caption, or your opinion. And when the timer ends, um, Kristen is going to help us share those ideas out as a group. So Kristen would be asking you to put them in the chat, I believe. Is that what you're thinking, Kristen? Yes, please. If you can put them in the chat um, and we do need all participation, please. And uh, we'll read them out after the very cool timer that you've provided us. <laughs>
Okay, I see that the timer has come up and we're still getting some more um, responses. That's great. I'm going to start reading some of the ones that we have, but uh, keep them coming, please. So we have one that says, look, that's my family watching me, which makes a lot of sense. Um, another one, I think that the two players are teammates in high school. And now that they're pro, they're pointing to their favorite high school teacher who came to watch them, even though she knows <laughs> nothing about football. Um, so Sarah says there are two football players. One is pointing so that covers a, a sentence that just describes the pictures. Um, Lindy says, see the goalposts? Don't kick the ball in there. And the guy in the blue shirt is trying to confuse the new guy on the other team. I think that's a good idea <laughs> and something our kids probably would say. Uh, that guy over there, that's another comment. Nice. And, <laughs> and then uh, Katie added, look at that. I think that fan is dressed up just like you. So all good comments and captions. Yes, so um, it's always fun to hear what people come up with. Um, you know, the first thing I thought of was, um, oh, look, there's my mom. Um, and it's interesting, too. I'm, I'm glad that some people made um, observations and described the picture. I think, again, that kind of, uh, it shows that it, when we have the makeup of our, our mindful art group, again, we have some, some kids that, um, hear other comments they hear that someone is saying something that's funny or you know kind of clever and sometimes i think that they then shy away from like oh well all i'm going to say is that the guy's pointing well that's a really important thing to notice because again you're you're taking the time to really observe a situation think about it and and you you're you're saying what's happening there which i think um builds in again to that that authentic conversation and, and the empathy, like you're starting to notice other people and what they're doing. It's not just what you are doing. Um, and I think too, it's awesome. So Michelle, um, Michelle and I usually get a good giggle because we'll have a sports picture like this and I don't know anything about football. And we usually have one or two um, people in the group who know a lot about football. So my observations of things are much more basic or are are very i have very different observations of things than they do they have a very football um centered observation and you know i'll kind of be like oh that guy in the purple shirt so you know a lot of times the kids will know exactly who that is or um kind of what they have to do with um the image that's actually happening so um going back then to our presentation What I wanted to do to wrap it up today is I just, you know, I, I think again, one thing that happened to me in the spring was that it was a lot to consider. Um, I, I had the social emotional piece definitely at the forefront of my mind. Um, what are ways that we can connect with students during a very difficult time? Um, on many different levels, um, but I was also struggling as a teacher who had never used this technology before or had used it minimally. Um, how do I figure out how to do that piece so that I can then remove that as a barrier between me communicating with my students? Um, and so as we move into the school year, obviously things are very much up in the air and are changing rapidly. And so I think that, um, you know, I think I'm hoping today that these lessons and these ideas really help you either be inspired to kind of come up with your own thoughts or ideas about how you can encourage empathy and authentic conversation um, if we're virtual or hybrid or in person with social distancing, however it looks. Um, and I'm hoping that if you aren't sure and you want to use some of the stuff that I've provided today, that you are welcome to use that as well. Um, I think it does have interdisciplinary connections. Um, I think there are some ELA pieces that can definitely be incorporated here. Um, I think many different teachers, many different uh, staff members and and groups can use this uh, or use these concepts in some way. Um, and so I, I think that 
it's really important that we consider these things because as you all know so well, um, there's just added stress and added trauma at this point to what has already been going on in our students' lives. And so it's more important than ever to really try to find ways to make connections with them um, that are kind of innovative and unique to how we might traditionally do things. So um, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Um, and that's it. Kristen? We can unmute also if you'd rather just speak the questions at this point. That um, would be fine with me if people want to do that, whatever. I'm not sure right. if you have questions. I'm going to unmute mics. All right, everybody is unmuted now. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Melody, this is Katie Perry. Hi, Katie. Hi, I'm just curious if you are looking to set this in the fall virtually or what your plan is for this program in the fall, I guess. So um, actually, that's a conversation that uh, Michelle and I need to have with our building principal, um, what exactly it's going to look like. Um, I'm not quite sure yet of what my schedule is going to look like. Um, and I don't know that Michelle is is sure of what her schedule is going to look like. So I think there needs to be some, again, some flexibility around what it could be or how it could look. Um, just another thing that's up in the air right now. <laughs> well, either way, good luck with it. <laughs> Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Hi, Melody, this is Lindy. Hey, Lindy, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Um, I was just wondering if you, if there, if you've been what? involved in conversations that talk about using, using some of, using some of these um, ideas in a regular art classroom, like as just like an opener or um, tying it into an art class that isn't specifically a mindful art group? Right. So I think that what has kind of naturally happened is some of these concepts have kind of migrated over to my classroom. Um, you know, even things like using the using the timers, um, that timer that I had up on the screen, I was telling Kristen, um, they the students absolutely love it um, and and kind of will sit and watch it if they're done and waiting. So uh, creating those moments where they can kind of take a breath and, and that kind of thing. Um, also, you know, listening to music. Even when we're having conversation, like encouraging more of that conversation in their groups that they're in, um, is that kind of what you were thinking? Yes, yes, and just different like exercises. Maybe if you're doing, um, you know, whatever project you're doing, adding in um, more opportunities for perspective and feedback on, you know, maybe in critique or that is encouraging empathy and conversation rather than um, a maybe purely academic kind of exercise. Right, so I think that um, a couple of things, I think using visual thinking strategies in, in the art room has helped with that. So that's where they look at a piece of artwork and they ask three, you know, I ask three kind of directed questions about what's going on in the picture, what do you see that makes you say that, and what more can you find? That has been helpful. Um, instead of just looking at it in addition to sometimes or instead of looking at a piece of artwork where um, I'm asking them to find, you know, an element of art or discuss a specific art um, concept, that you get more of that thoughtful piece and you get that piece of um, similar to accountable talk where they're kind of listening to each other and building off of what someone else is saying and also finding evidence within the picture. So that has kind of lent itself to it. Um, and so I feel like practices like that and, and 
kind of just talking more about how are you solving this problem? Well, how did someone else in the class solve the problem? So moving more towards a, um, again, during a critique, instead of focusing as much time on the actual concept of what we were doing, definitely touching on that because it is very important in our curriculum, but also um, then like, well, so let's look at this person's artwork and how did they interpret this or how did they solve that I asked them to do it a certain way. Um, kind of working in those parameters um, and trying to introduce more of those opportunities. Like when I had, um, well, when Katie Perry came in and, and we did a, a project together, a STEAM project, um, it, it really introduced more of those concepts of innovating an idea and problem solving, which I think leads itself more to these conversations. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, that's helpful. Okay, we have about five minutes, four minutes left. Are there any other questions? Melody, do you want to um, mention maybe some of the other projects that you've done? I mean, you have so many great things, just maybe some examples. Um, we've had the opportunity, Michelle and I have had the opportunity to present some of our other lessons that we've done. So another one that we had presented at Urban Schools Conference, which I think um, would tie into this concept, um, was making collage. Um, in the way that we did it there, it was a group collage where people had an opportunity to kind of select images from magazines that spoke to them and then kind of add them into a one collage. Um, again, how can we do that in a more separated way? You know, maybe it's um, personalized collages and then we find some kind of connections between those. Um, so that's one that I'm thinking really would lend itself to a different format if necessary. Um, we have done, we, we usually do a lesson that is based on color and emotion. Um, there's a book that's called The Color Monster. It's a pop-up book and it's amazing. Everyone in Mindful Art loves it from K through five. Um, it just talks a lot about the relationship between um, how color can reflect emotion um, in art and, and I mean, obviously in life. Um, and then the students make a piece of artwork with uh, an image of them, a digital image, where they then paint the background to reflect the feeling that they're showing in the image. So if they're happy, what would it look like? What would the lines look like? What would the colors look like that represent happy as opposed to lines and colors that might represent sad or angry, um, different emotions there. Um, do a mask project. Oh, one of, the, one of our favorite ones is a puppet project. Um, they make these little puppets that symbolize someone in their lives that makes them feel good. Um, so that is something, again, you could shift it over into drawing a picture of someone that makes you feel good. Why do they make you feel good? Um, and, and then the students, it's an awesome project because you really kind of learn about the people in the students' lives that really support them. Sometimes it's a classmate. Sometimes it's that's Michelle. Often it's Michelle. Um, sometimes it's other teachers in the building or an uncle. Um, one little girl made her her sister's friend who she does cheerleading with, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, those are the lessons. That's great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. right. Any last thoughts, questions, comments? Oh, okay, go ahead. Did, did I hear that right? Did somebody have a question? All right. Well, Melody, thank you so much for all of your expertise and everything that you presented. Thank you guys so much for coming to this session. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good rest of the conference. If you stop in front of the external.